This is Femi Kuti, and you are listening to NYC Radio Live. All right, you're listening to NYC Radio Live. David Ellenbogen here. Great to be with you. Uh, this is pretty cool. I got to hang with Samir Gupta, Parul Shah, and Karu Wantanabe. And um, they've got a show coming up bringing together traditions of Japan and India, music and dance, taiko drumming, and tabla tarang. It's all happening very soon, so I'm, I'm throwing this uh, episode together quite rapidly. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and it, a lot of people are have become more familiar with Karu Antanabe from the movie Isle of Dogs, of which he contributed to the, the taiko drumming and some other stuff to the soundtrack. And... Um, We'll be listening to his new album, Neo, uh, throughout this uh, throughout the discussion. And um, Neo has Barbara Merjan, Fumi Tanaka Date, and Sayun Chang on taiko voice and percussion. I hope I pronounced all that pretty good. <laughs> anyway. Um, it's a beautiful album, and um, yeah, let's let's actually check out the song "Dreams," and then we'll hang out with Parul Shah, Samir Gupta, and Karu Wantanabe. Enjoy. Ha.
Caro, how did you end up doing this, <laughs> like in, in general? The, the koto, the taiko drums, uh, yeah, what brought you to this point? I, I grew up in the United States. I, uh, I played the, the taiko growing up, but very informally just for fun. But I was a pretty serious classical musician and a jazz musician. Eventually, that's what brought me to New York. Went to Manhattan School of Music as a jazz flute player, saxophone player. Um, but then it was when I decided to graduate, when I graduated, I decided... That's when I needed to know more about Japanese music. I didn't know anything about Japanese music. I didn't know anything about... I didn't speak the language. Um, couldn't speak to my own grandparents, you know. Uh, and I think studying jazz kind of drew me that to that conclusion more than anything, is the idea of if you want to study music, then, you know, what it's not just studying scales and rhythms and, and practicing, you know, playing, you know, Charlie Parker tunes in every key. It's It's more like, where does the music come from? And... Why, why did Charlie Parker play like that? Not just f theoretically, what is he doing, but where did he come from? And what kind of life did he live? And what kind of, you know, and um, being able to relate music to culture. And for me to completely feel disassociated with Japanese culture felt something that felt very empty uh, for me. So I moved to Japan. I spent 10 years uh, performing with a group called Kodo. And they tour internationally and the, and the part of the, even the training to join the group was about studying all sorts of traditional musics and dances song, singing growing rice uh making your own sticks out of uh, you, planing them from a block of wood you know like it goes really deep um living a you know kind of a traditional life more than any kid from Tokyo would for example um and so I, I I kind of went that route and then eventually joined the group and was touring the world kind of representing Japanese culture uh, so that was a, a huge journey for me 10 years uh, spent in Japan then I moved back to New York and um kind of continued on that path where I'm really more aggressively approaching all the music that's, that I had done before moving to Japan plus all this other stuff that I did in Japan and then working with people like Samir and Parul to like try to expand on my my knowledge and my my vocabulary and my the depth of my understanding of of what the music is about and what it could be about. So what what does growing rice 
Can you put it to words? What, what particularly? Yeah. What What did growing rice teach you about Japanese music? Um. So a lot of the the Japanese music. There's there's classical music, the theater music of kabuki theater, no theater, etc. But there's also the folk music, right? And there's the festival music, the folk dances that happen d- depending on the town or the village or the city. It could be in the fall. It could be in the spring. But a lot of them revolve around planting season, around the seasons. Right, and the people who do them, who perform these these ritual dances and songs, they're not professional musicians, but they're farmers, and they're people who they they're bent over planting rice and preparing the field, and then plant and then cutting the rice in the fall, and you know there's there's a whole process of of creating the rice that when you study certain dances, especially from these agricultural you know traditions, even the way you lift your foot could be um if if you're if you're standing in six inches of water and mud you can't just lift your foot and start walking like you would if you're walking on the street in manhattan so when you're doing a dance and you're trying to lift your feet up you the way you point your foot toe downward as you lift your knee upward and then when you plant it again how you can very easily lose balance and how you have to kind of get your legs a little bit wider get your lower body a little bit lower you know that that informs the body about how, what is necessary, right? And then that connects the body deeper to the earth. And then the whole, and then when you take that, those movements and those rhythms, and then you do that in the festival, which is, again, celebrating harvest or, cel- or praying for a good crop, it all kind of brings everything into very sharp focus, right, in terms of, them informing each other the religion the spirituality the ritual the movement the nourishment of the body and of the of the soul so it's all kind of a holistic thing that there's no other way to to really understand that mm. and, and Pearl, I, i'm sure that in katak dance there's a, millions of, of of symbols going on right can you can you talk a little about some of some of that um, sure. Uh, I just want to say, Koro, I think that was really beautiful what you just said. Uh, and very similar uh, to that tradition is uh, the the intentions of Indian classical dance, of all Indian classical dance. And those are the concepts, again, of, you know, being really connected to the earth, um, connecting to the natural elements of the world, and at the same time, connecting to yourself and to your audience. So there's there's a lot going on, um, but there's, and th- hence, that's why yoga is, you know, it's from India and very tied to Indian classical dance, because it's, you're really, it's, it's a constant, um, it's a spiritual journey at all levels. Um, so I think that that's just one thing that has always kept me from going, uh, going too far, going astray from Indian classical dance. I always come back to Kathak because like Koru, I grew up over here. I've seen so many dance forms and I love all the dance forms. But I think what brings me always back to uh, to Kathak is this connection, the connection to yourself and this, this journey um, of constant growth. And of course, that happens and should happen in any form that you study. The difference is that that is embedded in in Indian classical dance. Um, so to answer your question about symbolisms, uh, we have so many. Uh, in all the Indian classical dance forms, we have more than 100 hand gestures that we use that signify two or three different meanings. And in this piece, actually, I'm probably exploring uh, these what we call mudras or hastikas more than I ever have. Uh, so we have, there's the cow herder that I show, and of course Krishna and the flute and, and Radha. Um, but what I'm also trying to do is use my body language um, in a different way to show Krishna as a cow herder uh, or, or Radha. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great to take these... Uh, these hastikas or mudras, these hand gestures, and try to deconstruct it in a way that is a little bit more um, open uh, and is not as esoteric, so it could be understood by, you know, a larger group of people. Hmm. All right. Well, I know you guys are busy getting ready for the big show, which is uh, next Friday, the 25th, I think. Uh, All right. I'll do that again. <laughs> I guess you get ready for the big show at um, Room Museum. Um, and, uh, yeah, any last 
thoughts on, on what we can expect here? Um, I think that you should expect something that you know you really haven't seen or heard before, and I think that's part of what uh, draws Brooklyn Raga massive and a lot of the creative energy in New York um, outside of out of outside of Raga massive. Even just I think being in New York gets you very tapped into the creative energies across a lot of great artists. And so when you bring those really creative minds together, it, it usually is very, very interesting. And I think that the special thing we're doing here is the development. You know, it's not like we've just come together sort of randomly, like we've spent months, you know, really cultivating this idea and trimming away and focusing in and kind of highlighting these elements that we think are very rich. And so that kind of care and that kind of development, I think, makes it stand out. And I think that's going to be really powerful for people. Yeah, do you guys think, I mean, I've, I've heard some really, like, ancient forms of, or I was told they were ancient forms of Japanese music, and it sounded so modern. And I guess you, you could make the same argument that some uh, of the, the the earliest Indian musical forms also have, like, a, a kind of crazy modernity element, you know? I mean, a tampur could sound like the craziest electronic instrument you've ever heard or something. Like, do you guys think you n- one needs to make an effort to be modern <laughs> or, or, or to, to make an effort to blend blend cultures when it's all just happening? I don't know if it's a need to do it. But yeah. it's, it's, I think for us, it's, it's just fun on a yeah. very basic level. Yeah. And just hanging out with Samir and, and, and having a drink and chatting about art and, and then jamming and trying to like find these musical connections. Um, it, it, it's such a big part of Brooklyn culture, New York culture and, and kind of contemporary culture in general, but um, it, it, it just opens up so many worlds, you know, and it's just, I don't think we're like, we're trying to like, okay, let's make something really new and really fresh and really, you know, let's blow people's minds. It's not, it's nothing like that at all. It's just, you know, try first starting off with just jamming and playing different rhythms and then, oh, well, what does this mean? Like, what can this symbolize and how can we create something that, again, that resonates in a different way and maybe approaching it through the lens of folklore or, or you know, traditional cultures might give it a, a different kind of um a viewpoint that we might not usually have or you know it's just a it's just a kind of exploring i think just having fun with it um it's not like this strange mission yeah i think it's it's an interesting question dave like you know a lot of these instruments sound so modern in a way because they're so foreign like they're so like otherworldly sounding like who would have thought to just drone for an hour on an instrument you know and a lot of people who are not familiar with Indian music those instruments sound very different and they sound like sometimes like is that a synthesizer is that some kind of modern contraption that was invented like no these are old instruments and a lot of times when a lot of times those instruments last and they resonate with people because they're timeless in a way they kind of tap into something that that I think is always going to be relevant for a person. And, and it could be something as simple as like the buzzing tone of certain instruments, the timbre of an instrument. On a tabla, when you hit that note right, it sounds like a bell, right? It sounds like a clear bell. And that that really kind of hits the head. It hits the consciousness in a cool way. And I think when the taiko, with the with the way the skins are made and the body, and when you feel it in your in your gut, that's a very powerful feeling, you know? And it's it kind of will always sound um, like something bigger than time or people or a place on the planet. You know, it's like almost like the sound of the cosmos or something, you know? Well, I guess that's a good note to end it on. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you guys. I'm very excited to check out the uh, uh, Nature, War, and Love project featuring Parul Shah and Karu Wantanabe and Samir Gupta. And I'm sure there'll be more to come. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. All right. Well, that was fun. Thanks for the hang, everybody. Um, We're going to take it out with the song Shinobu from the same uh, brand new album from Karu Watanabe called Neo, as well as the, the group is called Neo. All right. Peace.